What's up, OUXers? Sophia here, Chief Evangelist for Object Orient UX, and I am <laughs> finally, finally here biting the bullet and making, not really biting the bullet. I shouldn't say biting the bullet. I'm very excited about this video, but I am finally, I don't know why it's taken me so long to make what I'm hoping is going to be a less than five minute, less than 10 minute, as short as freaking possible, succinct explainer of object mapping and what object mapping is all about. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's jump into it. I'm going to put more resources in the notes on other places you can go. Cause I know I'm going to mention like 17 other things or more, and I will just try to point you in the right direction. But object mapping, this is the, this is the crown jewel of object oriented UX. This is the artifact that is being used all over the world to help tackle complexity and give people x-ray vision into the user experience from a data and content first perspective. All right. We've got developers using object maps too, to actually help plan out databases. And we've definitely got designers and developers working together on these things to get on the same sheet of music and just make communication so much better. Oh, and business folks too. Stakeholders. Can we get the requirements right before we get into Figma? All right. Well, before, can we, can we get the structure right when we are in sticky notes? Because sticky notes are cheap. Okay. So object mapping helps avoid so much rework. It helps get everybody on the same page, give everybody on the team that x-ray vision, and it is just magic. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm going to explain this to you. So first, I don't want you to be thinking implementation yet. The object map is that step before implementation, that step before screens. We're just figuring out the truth, the, the truth of what these objects are, what are the core concepts within a user's mental model, within the business model, and what is their structure. And how do they all relate to each other? So each of these columns, if you will, is starting to feel like a, a detail page. Okay. It's like a prototype of a prototype before you get into prototyping. Okay. So it is this early stage embryonic, if you will, structure of what likely a detail page, the information that is going to be on a detail page. So this column format is very kind of like mobile first of you're going to have that sort of forced hierarchy of attributes. Okay. All right, hmm. backing up. Let's talk about color coding and just the components within an object map. Okay, so you've got across the top, you've got your objects. I will call your hosts because you've got objects inside as well. But objects, we put objects on blue. Let's just all do the same color coding because I have this dream of us being able to look at each other's object maps and just being able to see into, see that, get that x-ray vision, right? So we've got our objects. Then we've got... Um, yellow, that is our core content and pink is our metadata. So I often get the question, what is the difference between these? How do we actually determine the difference? Yellow is basically what makes each instance unique. These are your unique identifiers, images. I often call it like the art or not often. I've been calling it recently. Like this is the art and where each instance is going to have a unique value. Pink is your metadata where you are going to be likely leveraging, sorting, and filtering. Okay. Danny Norton and OAUXer, she has yellow is the stuff that you search for. Pink is the stuff that you sort and filter for. Okay. That, that helps too. Also, pink is kind of like the, um, the fodder for your algorithms. Okay. So this is the stuff that the computers are really good at reading. They're getting better at reading core content with all the AI out there, but in general and historically, it's going to be the metadata that's much more computer readable. Um, and also yellow is often a human is having to create it. Again, that is changing a little bit more. Humans are creating the yellow stuff. Pink could be created by humans and or computers. Okay. But really think yellow is the art. Pink is kind of like the science. Okay. And both of these represent attributes. Then we've got more blue. Okay. So the blue underneath the object host is also objects. This is all contextual. Okay. Our blue underneath the object are our nested objects or, um, uh, lovingly called our nesties. So our nesties are just the, they're just objects that are showing up on other objects. Okay. So these are relationships manifested. And this is when we get into cardinality and, um, I'll walk through the object map. This is not going to be five minutes, is it? Ah, it's so hard. I'm going to try to make this as short as possible, I promise. Um, these are your relationships manifested where we get into cardinality, and that is going to make a little more sense when we get into the example. And then we have green. 
which is technically not part of the object map, that's part of the CTA matrix, but they can be, I'll, sh I'll show you sort of how that can be part of an object map. So our green are actions that the objects call the user to take. So what, how can users manipulate each of these objects? That gets us into functionality. Okay, and so all of this comes together for the very best acronym in the whole world. We've got our O, oh, I should probably have this better in order. Our R, which is relationships. Our A, which are attributes, which actually I consider all three of these as attributes, but the relationships are incredibly important. So we spend an entire step in the process on the relationships. And then we have the C's. Orc. No, just kidding. It's Orca. Okay, so let's step up here real quick. So the ORCA process, um, objects, relationships, CTAs, and attributes. This is the ORCA process. I should probably move those, <laughs> those big letters up here, but we don't have time for that. Um, the ORCA process is 15 freaking steps, okay? But it is remixable. It is flexible. You can mix and match it. You can shuffle things around. You can pick and choose. It's basically a bunch of techniques that nicely hang together and inform each other and give you clarity. But basically we go for our O's, our R's, our C's, and our A's multiple times getting in higher and higher in fidelity. And you can see object mapping, which was really all OAUX was like nine years ago. And now you can see object mapping is just one part of this whole Orca OAUX world, which um, I just hope you get more and more into. Okay. So object mapping. Let's look at an object map. So in this object map, we are mapping out um, a bakery. Okay. And we would get to these objects through noun foraging. That is a, that's another video. That I'll put a link in the show notes on a um, really great podcast episode that I go into noun foraging on. But basically that's you look at your research, you look at your user interviews, you look at what your stakeholders are saying, you look at your competitors, and you look for the nouns that come up over and over and over and over again. And you figure out what the objects are from that. Um, objects have what I call SIP, that's structure, instances, and purpose. Another thing for another video. Okay. So let's look at the store location. Okay. It's got a store name. And often in that first unique identifier, which is usually a name, I'll put some example names, which gets us to example instances. So Midtown location, what did I say? Virginia Highlands location, downtown location, right? Um, and then we've got, so for employee, you know, I might put uh, Sophia Prater is a good example of an employee of a bakery. Baked good, I might put walnut choco chip cookies. Um, uh, da, 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 da. What, what kind of baked good do I want right now? Uh, this, let's see, uh, gluten free bear claw. Wouldn't that be great? Um, cool. So that's some examples. And then allergens. What is an example of allergens? Is it dairy or dairy free? No, the allergen is dairy, peanut, wheat, or I'll just say gluten, right? Okay. So that gives me some instances, right? So I love putting instances in to get a really clear idea on what the objects actually are. Um, and for storytelling, okay, it really helps with storytelling. Okay, let's just, okay, let's go down the store. Um, this embryonic detail page here. Um, so we've got the store name, we've got the photo, we've got its GPS location, which I might want to sort and filter right by, show me the closest location, whether it is open right now or not. And then I'm going to see all the employees who work at this store location. So a store location has one to many employees who work at this store location. Okay. That is our relationship manifested. Okay. And then we got, we also have a description. We've got the bait goods available at this store location. Okay. And this, what we can do also with an object map is we can prioritize. Okay. So we can start seeing what is the most important attribute to the least important attribute, which again is creating sort of that guideline for designing our detail page. Okay. Now here's the cool thing. This right here can also show, start showing that navigation. So if I'm looking at a store location, all right, I can see all the employees that work there 
and maybe I can go to an employee detail page because it's a family business. All right. We want to see the employees. We want to get to know them. We want you to know everybody's name who works there. So we're having employee detail pages. If there are employee detail pages, I can start visualizing that I could click on a probably like a little grid of those employees. I can click on an employee and I can go and I can see all of this information. All right. And I don't need to worry in the store location. I don't need to worry about the fact that like the first name and last name of all employees and the profile picture is going to show up over here. All I need to do is I need to reference this column. And when we get into sketching and we start manifesting this into screens, I will know that I can bring employee cards over into the store location. I will have designed those employee cards, avoiding shape shifting and masked objects, a whole other thing. Um, I will have designed that employee card to show up over here on the store location, but maybe even under the baked good. Because this is this is Sophia's. This is Sophia's signature walnut chocolate chip cookie. Um, okay, so on the employee, I've got a first name and last name. I've got a profile picture. I've got their like title. Um, where are, are they? The manager? Are they a baker? Are they customer service? I have the store location. In this case, they have only one store location that they work at. We might have another in another context for another system. You could have an employee that works at multiple locations. Cardinality is huge in the OUX world. It totally can change the definition of a thing when you change the cardinality. And then we've got bio. Okay. All right. Moving over to baked good. Okay. We've got the name. We've got the price. And we might have price per unit. And do we want to have a unit actually? Right. So, and I will often put when it's like kind of unclear what that actually means, I will put p potential values in parentheses. So that could be like, is it a piece? Is it a ounce? Is it a, like, how do we measure? Do we measure things by a, the, the slice, by the actual cookie, by a, by a box? Maybe if it's the, by four of them. Anyway, maybe we have a unit and then we have category potentially. Is it cookie? Is it cake? Um, there might be additional categories as well. And this is what has the al this is the allergens that it is free of. Okay, so we can start saying um, peanut free. The, here's the stuff that you if you're dairy free. Mm, and again, like that's mm, is it allergens that this is free of, or is it allergens are always like is it dairy free, peanut free? What is the instance of an allergen? See, you start thinking about these things. Okay. And then we've got the photo of the baked good. Um, we've got a description of it and we potentially have the employee that created it. So then I can click back to the employee. Ooh, and we're missing something here. Cause if we have an employee detail page, we have the store location. We might also want, what am I going? What am I doing right here? I'm connecting the dots the other way. You will likely want to often connect the dots both ways. So if I have a baked good has zero to one employees who created that recipe, because maybe it's just, there's not like a specific creator. It's just like, these are just our chocolate chip cookies. Um, if I go over to the employee, I want to see all the baked goods. This purse created by this employee, right? Okay, cool. Um, and then we go over to the allergen. We've got the name of the allergen. We've got the little icon associated with it. We've got any kind of detailed safety information. Um, maybe this is like our, the lawyer's talking. Um, and then uh, we got allergen has zero to many baked goods free of this allergen. Okay. So this is a very simple system, very simple system, but object mapping is so extensible. I've worked with people that have had companies that have 200 objects. Of course you probably move into a different tool. Tools like Whimsical, Miro, um, Physical Sticky Notes are really great for workshopping and collaboration. And then likely we, we often, when we, things get more complicated, we move into a tool such as Notion or Airtable to do more um, to do more object mapping and getting into getting to all the requirements rounds where we actually get into the requirements behind each of these attributes. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so this is some pictures, <laughs> some object mapping in action. It's really fun to do as a group. Here it is going a little bit further in, um, oh, I don't even, this is, I don't even know what this tool is, Miro or something. Um, so we can go into other tools to, to do object mapping. At the end of the day, what it does is it gets clarity. It gets clarity. It gets everybody on the same page. And what you can avoid doing is you create your object map and you can even get approval on an object map 
before you go into sketching, okay? Before you go into prototyping. Instead of doing what we so often do, where we're still working out requirements, we're still working out content, we're still working out data while we're in high fidelity. And that is not the most effective way to work or collaborate, really. Okay, so that was not five minutes, but as short as I could possibly make it to give you an introduction into object mapping, um, going back to this, as you can see here, object mapping is just one tiny, tiny part of this. You can learn all about every single step in this process through the Object Oriented UX Masterclass and the Object Oriented UX Certification. You can go to ouxcom slash training to get all the options there. We also have a ton more free resources. So I hope you dive deeper into OUX and I hope object mapping serves you for your entire career. All right. Cheers, y'all. Happy OUXing.